With you having to remix for Let Me Clear My Throat with Biz, Biz Marquee and Dougie Fresh, how did you pick the two of them out of all the people you knew, worked with, or collaborated with? Uh, those are my brothers. I've been knowing both of them since around 87, 88. Rest in peace to Bismarck. I still can't believe he's gone. Um, and I just felt that they were the, the two artists that could really bring home the idea of that song. You know what I mean? Let Me Clear My Throat is definitely a hip-hop record, even though a lot of people outside here that don't know what Gogo is or what have you, they think it's a Gogo record. It's only, they only think that because of the fact that I'm doing it. You know what I mean? And they know that I'm from D.C. and they know that I have this Google background along with the hip hop background. But anyway, um, it is definitely a record rooted in hip hop. Um, how can I say this? In the fact that hip hop started at the party, as they say, two turntables and a microphone. You know what I mean? The DJ and the MC. And that's what that's what let me clear my throat is. Okay. The DJ and the MC rocking the party. And so who better than those two? And I was I was always curious too, did it have anything to do with they both beatbox too? Or no? No, not at all. That wasn't a thought, but I mean, you're right. You're right. I mean, you see what Dougie did. Oh, here's a fun fact. Okay. Um, when we did that record, um, both of their performances were impromptu performances. Nothing was written. They came to the video shoot that day. Uh, cool, what we gonna do? Biz, I need eight bars from you. Dougie, I need eight bars from you. They just came right off the top. And I said, I'm gonna lead you in and I'm gonna lead you out. Now, obviously they already know the song because they've heard it a million times. But I said, well, let me change it up a little bit. Like the little break beat part I put in there, which was, uh, I was using Sing Sing, which is a real popular break beat that a lot of uh, DJ producers use in Baltimore. You might the boom, 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 Right? Which is disco, for real, for real. But a lot of hip hop people and a lot of like club music and house music people really love that break. So I said, well, let me incorporate that too. Yeah, I am being a DJ again. You know what I mean? Um, but what they done was very, very impromptu. Even, even the part when Dougie was talking about put two fingers in the air. When I say two, you say Pac. Remember, Tupac died a week before that. Right. And we were celebrating, you know what I mean? Or, you know, commemorating his death or what have you. Or recognizing, you know, his passing or what have you. And Dougie just did that. And I just, I just rock with him because that's just the way that we flow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it was very powerful, especially since it had just happened. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, another thing soon thereafter that was very powerful that I loved was getting the, the best of uh, Go Go Volume 2 that you had put together. So what, what made you creatively and business-wise and career-wise coming off this huge thing, uh, let me clear my throat, the two versions, all this, to then do like a go-go mixtape album compilation? Uh, that was a project that I was asked to do by, um, shout out to Becky Marcus and Tom Go Gofogu uh, of Liaison Records at the time. They, they now have two separate situations um, uh, that they're doing nowadays. But back then, they had liaison records and a uh, uh, distributor. And they say, cool, man, you know, we need you to put this go-go mixtape together. I was like, that ain't nothing. <laughs> so, and so uh, I started putting all this stuff together, and there you go. Okay. And how do you remember your process of picking the songs for that? Stuff that I play in the club, that's all. Joints that I knew was hot. You know, Huckabucks, Northeast Groovers, or uh, I don't know what else was on that thing. Man, that's been, I need to go back and listen to that. I haven't heard that in years, to be honest with you. No, uh, it's, it's a lot of great stuff on there. You should definitely get it. Yeah, I need to check it out. Yes. So then, 
uh, obviously soon thereafter or a couple of years later, people, you know, you had all these kind of remix records that were coming out that you, I guess, were or were not affiliated with. But then getting with the how and why did you and Redman end up working so well together? Ah, I'm Doctor. <laughs> I've just always been a fan of his. And um, I met Doc in 1994, around the time when 20 Minute Workout came out. And he was so high, he couldn't slap his own ass with both hands when I, when I first met him. It was him and Eric Sermon. And he was um, he was mumbling to me that he wanted to remake 20-Minute Workout. And I was like, eh, I don't think that's the record for you in my head. But I said, I'm going to let that thought marinate. So then uh, around 2001, I got a phone call. And uh, which I thought was a prank phone call at the time, but it was actually him. He was like, cool, uh, I'm in L.A. with meth, and they were working on something. He said, I want, I want to bring you out here. He said, because I got this record I want you to get on. All right, boom. Next thing you know, I'm in L.A. Uh, myself, Doc, uh, Eric Sermon, and uh, um, Rockwiler, who's one of my favorite hip-hop producers, period, and a very good person. They let me, I said, all right, play the track. I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. What? All right. So uh, he's, he was like, cool. Every time you hear me say, let's get dirty, I want you to say something before and something after it. And I didn't think about the fact at the time that he wanted me to get into this, this call and response thing. You know what I mean? Like he wanted that piece of me. You know what I mean? So I wrote something down. I went in the bar. I went, I'm in the booth other, laid it down. And we listening back to it, and they was like, yeah, that's hot, that's hot. I'm like, nah, that ain't hot. I know what you want. <laughs> so I said, let me get, let me, let me start back over. So I went back in, and uh, uh, I guess to make a long story short, the hook came out the way that it did. When you, if you're pumping this one in your truck, let's get dirty. Say, let's get dirty. The crowd, let's get dirty. You know, so um, that is a song that did very well for us when we performed it on the road. Like every time we do that song, like the, the place just explodes. It's, it's just crazy energy with that record. So shout out to Rock Wild. He's the one that put that track together. Right. Now when Let's Get Dirty compared to all your other hits as a solo artist, what difference, like what was the difference that you noticed either performing or how people interacted with you? Like how, how were things different? that it was a Red Man song, not a DJ Cool song? Uh, I, don't know. I don't know if I could say it was different. Like, the energy was there. You know what I mean? Like, just like I said, I later found out, like, why Doc wanted me to perform that record. He wanted that. He wanted this. You know what I mean? And he has a lot of energy himself. Like, he is just incredible. Anybody that's never heard Red Man, like, he is he is a life-changing moment. If you've never heard him and you get an opportunity to hear him and to actually see him perform, especially with Method Man, is really uh, the only duo that I think can really stand up to them. Not shit did too fast, but in my opinion, the only duo, performance duo, that can only stand up to them as far as hip-hop is concerned, in my opinion, is Buster Rhymes and Split Star, as far as energy is concerned. You know what I mean? Um... But not to get too far off track, I think this is what, how can I say? It's just the energy. The energy was just there. You know what I mean? We had the right symmetry and, and everything. It just worked. It just did. So I, 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 uh, I really didn't feel any difference because at least I got a chance to bring myself to that. He didn't want to, nah, man, I don't want you to do it. Like, you know what I'm saying? He didn't try to change me like I. I want you to be you. That's why you here. You know what I'm saying? I don't want you to try to be me or anything like that. Like, I'm going to handle this project, like, from the lyrical standpoint. I want you to just bring your energy, you know what I mean, to this. To just take it from here to here. You know what I mean? So, really wasn't no difference. Okay. To me. Now, this was also a time where I was like, okay, the DJ Cool album must be about to happen. So, why did you... <laughs> Why didn't you put out another album after this was doing so well? Remember, I was sitting on the shelf from 98 to 2003. Whoa, you were that's still signed that whole time? And they yeah, wouldn't have... That's, oh, what I, that's what I meant earlier about when you was asking me about the situation with American Records. 
And I said it was strange. I think that was the wrong choice of words. The right phrase to describe that situation was it was fucked up. <laughs> it was. It was not good. And people didn't know what they were doing with me. Basically, and I, I'm going to say this because, you know, what are you going to do? Rick Rubin and them just got on the bandwagon with that record with it clear my throat. Oh, the record's hot, man. Let's get that. You know what to do with me. Well, I was about to say, he did Sardines with Junkyard. How could he not know how to make Go-Go? <laughs> like, or how to make it? Let's get Rick Rubin in here right now. Can somebody get him in here? I... <laughs> wow. That question. I have no idea. I think, for real, I think he was just going through a lot at the time, trying to find out exactly what was going to be a good landing spot for his label situation at the time because remember they had, they had lost their distribution with Warner at the time now they're over at Sony and I guess he's trying to get over there and get a foothold on that situation over there and try to figure things out so. so so that being said did they explain to you why they kept you so long and then when you finally got out why did they say they let you out No, if it's you, you didn't. Over the phone. Wow. He asked me, how was Trouble Funk doing? What's Trouble Funk had to do with me? I'm your artist that just went gold. Why are we talking about Trouble Funk? And this is nothing against Trouble Funk. That could have been, why are we talking about anybody but me? I called you to talk to you about me and what's, what's going to happen to me. Right. You know what I mean? So. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are questions I've had since the time. So now I understand the confusion even you feel. Mm -hmm. To this day, but I've let it go and I moved on. I mean, you got to. You yeah. know what I mean? You have to. I was hurt for a moment. And I guess it's because I wasn't taking my own advice because I tell one of the things that I tell a lot of young artists is do not let this industry break your heart because if you do, it will. And I know that's a strange sounding way of saying things, but yeah. Well, I will you not break your heart, it will. And, that, and so I kind of went against my own... Uh, principles for a moment for a brief moment i said you know what man not dj cool i don't need them bammers like for real for real i can still put hot music together yeah well i was gonna say it's it's a testament to you and congratulations that it didn't sap your drive and and who you are because the the thing that people always forget to your point is it's the music business and you got to keep the love for the music is the most important regardless of the business. And that's something that that's something I think uh, a lot of people that I've talked to or that I know that are not involved in the entertainment industry forget that artists are the people too. Like it's not, they're not just on a TV screen. They're, they're real people that have emotions and feelings and, are trying to do this to make a living in addition to create create music. And that's mm -hmm. that's crazy. Right. Secondary, <laughs> if you think about it, you know what I mean? Um, before we move on any further, I'd just like to give you your pop in the fact that I think this is probably one of the best interviews. And I've had a lot of interviews. I've had a lot of great interviews. Don't get me wrong, but I think this is a very, very good interview, so. I just want to give you props for setting the table the way that you set the table. You know what I mean? Like, excellent interview. Well, thank you, DJ Cool. As you could tell, I've been uh, studying and listening and loving your music forever. So since I was, before so I could much. drive. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I could talk to you for eight hours. We won't last that long, but yes. But, <laughs> but um, around this time, too, I was the... The song that blew me away the most was the Macho Man Randy Savage. So 
<laughs> I never understood the song or what happened. So what in the world led to Hit the Floor with Randy Marshall Man Savage? <laughs> First of all, may he rest in peace. Uh, before anything, I was just a huge fan of his uh, as a wrestler. And um, shout out to my man, uh, Khalid. Uh, he's actually from here. He used to be a part of a group called the Pretty Boys back in the 80s. Uh, and um, he now lives in Tampa. And uh, he's also a producer as well, uh, KO Productions. Uh, cool, man. I got this record. He said, I'm working on this record with Macho Man. I'm like, Macho Man, Ra Randy Savage, Macho Man. Like, oh, yeah, Macho Man. Like, he was like, yeah, let me get out. He said, I want you to be on this. Like, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So I'm like, <laughs> you know what I'm So he was like, nah, man. So he sent me the record. Actually, he didn't send me the record. He brought me down to Tampa. And uh, he was working at this big, elaborate studio and whatnot. It was a place called uh, uh, Big Three Records or something like that. He had a whole lot of money. He was crazy. So he played the joint for me. He said, all right, cool. This joint's called Hit the Floor. I just want you to be DJ Cool on. I need you to write a hook for this. And here we go. And we did it. And it came out. And the next thing you know, I'm flying around in a private jet, running around with Randy Macho Man Savage. <laughs> I never got a chance to perform it with him. But we were going around doing like promo tours, like radio promo uh, stuff that we were doing. So we went to crazy places like Provo, Utah, and all these places that had all these big wrestling fans and whatnot. You know what I mean? It was dope. So we a lot of pop radio stations, but it was cool in the fact that these stations were still very familiar with me and uh, at least clear my throat. You know what I mean? Because just like I said earlier, the record went pop. So they were like, oh, you got DJ Cool here, that type of thing. So it, it was just cool to run around with him, man. And uh, he was a real person. He was a little bit more than, oh, yeah. He was a lot, he was a lot deeper than that. You know what I mean? I found out that he actually uh, uh, played professional baseball in the, um, in the minor league. And uh, I think he had a, a elbow injury or something like that. He, 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 was, a, he was a pitcher and whatnot. Okay. And so <laughs> that's what uh, stopped him from making it to, uh, to the majors. But uh, just a real down-to-earth dude, man. I was so hurt, you know, to hear of his past. Yeah, that was... Uh... You know, I grew up w watching a lot of WWF back in the day. So. Yeah. <laughs> but well, my man was just incredible. Like, you know what I mean? I like a lot of those cats. I'm a big Ric Flair fan. You know what I mean? Woo! You know? <laughs> big, so those guys, because the personalities were so big. You know what I mean? They almost kind of remind me of my uh, my music. You know what I mean? In a particular type of way. Because I like everything big. I like big voices and big drums and all that kind of stuff. And so those guys kind of fit to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. So what? How how did you guys not ever end up performing it then? If you were doing all this promo, ah right, man, I don't know. I don't know what happened. They was, <laughs> and then next thing you know, I heard that he passed away. I'm like, man, that's crazy. But he did a whole album, and a lot of it was dissing Hulk Hogan. <laughs> right. They they were definitely going at it, for real. <laughs> And he told me the story about that. I was like, it was like real beef for him and Hulk Hogan. And I think right before he passed, from what I heard, they kind of passed it up. You know what I mean? But he was like, man, he said some things about Hulk Hogan. I'm not going to repeat on this broadcast right here. <laughs> I'm like, well, for real. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. In the beginning, hip-hop was ruled by the East Coast. Then the West Coast rose to prominence, thanks to gangster rap. Hip-hop changed the world. Gangster rap changed the narrative. And then changed the world again. The history of gangster rap features unheard stories, unseen photos and documents, all with exclusive interviews from the founders and players who shape gangster rap. I think a real gangster rapper has to scare you a little bit. The history of gangster rap written by veteran rap journalist Soren Baker. In stores 
now. Yo, what up? This is DJ Quick. Be sure to pick up my homeboy Sern Baker's book, The History of Gangster Rap, if you really want to know what we do.